you know when you connect to a remote desktop session and it's got that certificate error that pops up? It seems to be a really common thing for people to just go ahead and leave as a standard configuration. And I was always curious how like that might actually be something that could help an attack, like a man in the middle type attack for the remote desktop protocol. Well, that led me into doing a little bit of digging and it wasn't long before I came across this tool on GitHub called Seth. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So stay tuned for this one. Okay, so let's set the stage and I'll kind of show you what it is that we're going to be doing and, and kind of walk you through everything. So here on the GitHub, this is where you can go out to download the tool if you don't have it already. Um, it, it's really easy to download. You just come in here, you can copy this out, and then you would run into like your, your Kelly box and you would just run a command like git clone and then paste in that address. Um, I've already got the uh, I've already got this on my box, um, but there's also a, a prereq that you need as well. Um, let me see. So the prereq that you would also need, you can install by doing this command here, that, which is the dsniff pack, uh, package. That also includes ARP spoof, which needs to be on the machine in order for this tool to work. Um, but once you have these two pieces, then we're ready to kind of move forward. So to to actually perform the attack. If we come into the, the help documentation, there there's a few things that we're going to need. So we need to know the interface we're running on, as well as the attacker IP, victim IP, and then the, the gateway or host IP of basically the, the target destination. So what we have is here on the top, we've got our victim computer, right? So this is going to be like the actual user who signs into his machine, and then he wants to try to connect to this computer here at the bottom. Now, this computer it could just be like a regular workstation that maybe he remotes into um, from you know a different part of the office. This could also represent like a, a remote desktop server that maybe is a shared computer that multiple people use. So this could be anything, but really this is just going to be our target destination in the example, and we're targeting this guy's user account. And the goal is to be able to steal his his username and password if we can. So this is the client. This is the server, and then this is the attacker machine that we're going to be using. So let's just grab the IP information of each. So we're going to be on ETH0 interface, and this is my IP address for the attack computer. So I'll come in here, and we'll just go ahead and list this all out. So the attack computer is going to be running at that address. We can grab the victim IP, which is going to be running at 10.0.0. .0. 20. And then we can grab the target IP. If you can't see this, that's okay. I know it's really small. That's going to be running at 10.00.250. So that's all of the pieces of the attack that we actually need. If we come back to the GitHub page, we can copy this down. And we just paste this into here. And I know we're going to need elevated permissions to perform it, so I will put sudo there. And then the interface, like we talked about, is going to be ETH0. The attack IP we've got listed at the bottom. That's the IP address of our Kali machine. The victim that we're targeting is going to be here at that address. And then the target on the other end is going to be at this address. Now, the command piece is optional. I'm just going to delete that. Um, but we can play with that afterwards and kind of get a get an idea of what that looks like. So this is the actual command we're going to run to perform the attack. But before I do, I just kind of want to show you what it is that we could expect to see. So I'm going to sign out of this machine just so there's no active sessions going on. And then from the victim, this is what he would normally do. Like when he gets into his office and he wants to connect to the computer at the bottom, he would normally open this up and I can even throw this out and save it on the desktop because this might be what you're used to seeing. It is something like this shortcut right there. And you just double click on this and you get a pop up and you might say, don't ask me again. And then you hit connect and then you get a credential prompt. And it's like, all right, well, what's your password to connect? So we will throw that in. And then this is the piece, this is actually where part of the attack is, is this pop-up message. It says, hey, we can't identify, we can't verify that that remote computer. I'm not actually running the attack yet. 
But this is something that's super common because a lot of IT administrators, they'll just leave the default self-signed certificates that throw these type of errors because things work. And yeah, it's, it's an encrypted connection, um, but it opens the door because now end users are just used to saying yes to that blindly anytime they see it. Uh, and that's bad. And, and I'll show you why. But we'll perform the connection here. And now we're connected to that remote computer at the bottom. So I will just go in and sign back out. So that's what it looks like when everything is working kind of like in a normal environment like it should. Then we'll come in and we'll see if we can actually perform this attack here. I will start by running the command. It's going to sit here and it's just kind of waiting for a, a call to come through. So now as that end user, I'll just come back and I'll just reuse the shortcut that we used last time. Again, we're used to seeing this, so we'll just say connect. And check this out. So now if we look at the text here on the left, it shows us that it tried to downgrade the authentication type. So that way it'll be able to, to decrypt that connection. But then it's, uh, it's also just listening for the next step of the way. So if we head back to this machine. I will type in the password, right? We expect it to see this. We'll just press OK. And then we also get a certificate error. But if we look back on the left side, we have this right here, which shows us this is the, the password hash of that user account. So this alone is already pretty bad because an attacker could take this and they could try to take it offline. Maybe they can crack it and pull out the clear text password. Maybe they can pass it around the network and do some sort of pass the hash attack, or maybe even try to relay it to another machine, depending on what type of hash this is. Um, but yeah, so we've already, already been able to do something. But if we look back, Again, we're, we're getting a certificate error. And this is going to happen every single time when we have a man in the middle attack like this. But if the end user is used to hitting yes to this, if they're used to seeing these type of certificate errors, they're not going to think twice. They're going to be like, oh, well, this is normal. So they're going to hit yes. The connection establishes. And then if we take a, lo uh, a look back over here on the left, check it out. We've actually got that password in clear text. So we can see. Everything that they, uh, what I mean, this could be like a super long, strong password that we would have never cracked based off this hash, but that doesn't matter because bam, we can see the clear text credential. So that's kind of cool. Um, there are some downsides to this tool. Like for one, I do notice some latency when I'm connected here. And I think that's because it's it's relaying the commands, right? So like when I actually come to click something and I go into like a notepad and I try typing, um, it's it's not terrible, it's, it's definitely workable, but it, it is noticeable to me. It doesn't feel quite as clean as if I was just going straight from this computer to this computer um, because it's got that extra hop through the attack machine. So that's, that's one downside to this. The other downside I would say um, is this tool doesn't seem to be working for me like it does for some of the other demo videos I've seen where if I were to type in this notepad, those keystrokes would show up on the attacker side. So in theory, they, it should be able to, to basically act as a keylogger and, and send any keystrokes that the victim is typing. I'm not getting that experience on my end, but you know, maybe, maybe it works for some people. Now, there is a catch to all of this. The only reason that this worked in the way that it did is because NLA was turned off. And that's not a default configuration in Windows 10. So if we come into the system and we look at the remote settings, oh, I'm going to get hit with a, a password prompt. Let me throw in a elevated user account. OK, um, so this checkbox right here, allow connections from anyone running network level authentication, that was turned off manually by me. And by default in Windows 10, it's, it's a feature that's turned on and enforced. Windows 7, however, does not enforce this and have it turned on. So if you have Windows 7 machines in the environment, there's a good chance they're not running NLA. And I'm sure there's other operating systems where NLA is not default, and maybe there's even versions of Windows 10. But as far as I know, all versions of Windows 10 come with this already pre-enabled. Pre now, what this check is going to do is this is going to force the the server this is going to force the the target that we're connecting to uh, to only allow that connection on the server side if nla is enabled but that doesn't do anything to protect the client so what that means is 
I just adjusted the server config, right? Because I'm still remotely connected to that machine to, to have NLA turned on. I'm going to sign off now. And then that's going to close the session out. I'm going to redo this attack. We'll just rerun this here. And then let's just try it again. Open this up, say connect. We'll get hit with, with a password prompt. Type that in. And then we get hit with a certificate error. And I say yes. And it doesn't allow the connection. OK, so this is because the server requires that NLA is enabled. Right? So the connection doesn't go through. But if we head back over to the attacker machine, that doesn't matter. The attacker was still able to get the clear text password because we're, we're hitting the client. We're not, we're not targeting the server. We're, we're actually performing the attack against the client. So even with those protections enabled, we can still actually get the, the client to, to be tricked into giving us the password. So you know what would an end user do at this point? They would get this error. They'd press OK. But then they'd probably just try again, right? They might, maybe they'll call their IT department. And then when they get on the phone with IT, IT will be like, oh, well, it doesn't seem to be still giving you the issue. It must have been a one time fluke. And then people move on and they forget about it. Because check this out we try again when, when we're not performing the attack and they sign right in and they move on with their day. So that's it. That's Seth. I, uh, I, I wanted to share this because it's something that I just learned about today. And I thought it was a really, really cool tool and a really interesting attack vector. Obviously, if, if you can get out of the habit of using these self-signed certificates, I think that's going to really help you. I think that that's going to help users not be so you know blindly trusting when they see those. Um, and that's, that's going to be a huge, huge factor in, in mitigating against this type of attack. If you like this type of content, let me know in the comments. Please do consider hitting the like button or subscribe button because I produce content like this all of the time. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks.